just a thought, some thoughts here talking about the changing world we live in. And one of the things I think it ought to happen as we come together each week is to, to uh, just think about things like uh, uh, how, to, how to thrive in the world in which we live, not just, not just get along, not just survive, but to thrive. And so I uh, could have called it something else, but I did a series years ago on how to live in Babylon. I may have used some of it here before, but this one I want to do, just kind of how to, how to thrive and, and, and not just survive uh, would probably be more adequate title. Uh, you have a worksheet, but we don't have PowerPoint tonight because the TVs aren't fully working yet. They work, uh, they do have electricity, but they don't have the computer hooked to them yet. So we'll have all that done by Saturday and uh, hopefully have that all working Sunday morning. But uh, I think you're going to find be real pleased with the TVs uh, because they're supposed to have, the specialist told us they have an 8 to 1 contrast better than what you had on the slide, on the, on the using the projectors. So it should be about eight times clearer than it was before. So we hope that's going to be the case. And by the way, the cost of this project, uh, we had gotten it bid out to a company that does it out of Ruston. It was going to be right at $20,000 to run all the, pull all the wires and everything. Well, our men, your men, have done it this week for $5,000. <laughs> and the $5,000 was donated by a church member. So it didn't cost us a penny to have those TVs up there. So that's a, they do look good, don't they? And they're heavy. If you don't believe that, they're heavy getting them up there. So, uh, but our guys have really done a good job on getting that up there, and I think you're going to be pleased this Sunday. So I'm going to have to help you fill in a few of the blanks tonight as we uh, go through this, okay? Uh, Revelation chapter 13, I'm going to read four verses, 11 through 14. I'm sorry, it's Romans. Yeah, what did I say? got Revelation and Daniel in my mind. I've been doing a lot more studying on that this week and getting ready for Sunday night. So, verse 11 through 14. And do this, knowing the time, now that's where we are today. The Bible says the wise men knew the times and what to do about it. And so it says we, uh, knowing the time, and now it is high time to awake out of sleep. Paul writing here to a church, a group of believers in Rome, and he says it's time to awake. It's time for the church to awake. There's a good word for us there, isn't it? For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. And that's a pretty safe statement because every day it's a little bit nearer. <laughs> when he talks about salvation, he's talking about the Lord's return, uh, him taking us to heaven. And so he says it's closer today than it was yesterday. And uh, it's closer today than it was Sunday. So it, we are closer. But uh, it's closer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us. Here's how to respond in that, in that dark day, in that day of anticipation. Let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly how you would act out, as he says, in the day. Not in revelry and drunkenness, Brenda. Not in lewdness and lust. Not in strife and envy. And the last verse. And put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. The lust of the earth. It's talking about there the lust of life, the lust of sin, the, the lust of the flesh. And uh, let me say a quick prayer before we go on. Father, as we study this today, we, we know we live in a changing world. Probably not all bad, but definitely not all good. But God, the only place you've told us to change is to, to be more like Jesus. You've told us to change and mature in Christ. And here you give us some guide points of how to best do that. I pray that we'd learn from this tonight. God, I pray that you'd help us to grasp it, to understand it, and then to do something about it. It's one thing if we understand something, but it's something else to do it. So tonight, Lord, help us to not just be hearers of the Word, as James said, but to be doers of the Word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. Amen. Now, some of you here tonight may not have any, any of these challenges uh, in your life, but it's a good chance we do have some challenges in our life, don't we? Some areas that we're weaker than other areas. And so today we look at what all is going on in our world. You could wake up tomorrow morning to World War III. It could happen while you're asleep tonight. We're that close. It just takes one loose trigger, one, one finger here, one finger there, push this button, that button. And uh, you're seeing all the things we were talking about at the house this week about uh, the AT&T outage last week. And this week it's a uh, Facebook outage. And, and, it's, and they've traced it all back. They know pretty much it's from China. And uh, China's testing us right now to see what we can stop. I will tell you, just make you these. I've been told that everything they can do to us, we can do to them. We can shut down their utilities. We can shut down their power grid. We can do all those things too, or at least we could. No telling over the last three years what of that we've lost. But uh, it's definitely we have capabilities. But you see with the technicalities that we have today, there's so many little buttons that could be pushed that you can't take back. You, you, you know, once that rocket's in the air, there's no taking it back. And uh, so th there's just so much that's on edge today, whether it's China attacking Taiwan or, or Russia and Ukraine or whatever it may be. By the way, I was supposed to leave for Ukraine Monday morning. If you haven't heard, I've had to cancel that trip. I uh, found out, huh? Hey, man. No, I wanted to go. <laughs> you didn't want me to go? I, I really wanted to go. Still was not afraid about going, but I canceled because I found out they wouldn't cover my life insurance over there. So if something happened to me, they wouldn't even pay off my life insurance because it's a war country. And so we canceled the trip to a later time. So now we're planning to try to go to Zambia and help them dedicate the church and the school over there. Probably going to do that in May. If someone would like to go, want to get with us before we buy tickets. I know right now me and Ron are going. And Luke is begging to go. So uh, right now it's three of us, uh, two of us. Uh, uh, Luke's gonna, we're going to see what kind of fundraiser Luke is over the next few weeks. But uh, uh, anyway, just we do. if you're interested in going, I'd like to go. Me and Ron are going right now. And uh, we're looking at tickets. And I'll tell you right now, tickets are about $2,000 a piece. <laughs> so uh, it's not easy, but we're going to fly in there and and do some ministry with those guys in Zambia for a few days. And uh, so just keep us in prayer about that. Here he mentions in each of these verses four things that I think we need to be. That's a good word to us. First one, fill in the first blank. Watch vigilantly. Watch vigilantly. Now I'm not going to spell all these words for you. I know right now some of y'all are saying, how do you spell vigilantly? You're on your own. Make it however you want it. V-I-G-I-L-A-N-T-L-Y. All right, moving right along. But verse 11 says to us, and doing this, knowing the time, knowing your world and the conditions that we live in, the changing morals and values and changing priorities of our world today, uh, learning how to live in a country that's overrun by people that you know nothing about. It might be terrorists, and we've probably got a lot more terrorists in our world today than we had a few years ago that nobody really knows anything about. We live in a dangerous time today. I would hate to think I was walking up down the streets of some of these big cities like New York and L.A. and Chicago. So we, we have a, a different world, and God says to us here, in awake, now, it's a, the, now it is high time, all right? In other words, get alert and be awake out of your sleep. What does sleep look like for us? What does spiritual sleep look like for us? Anybody give me some pointers on that? Huh? No, that's not how he means it here. Particularly the sleep that he's talking about here is a spiritual numbness. A spiritual lack of alertness. You know, where we're not really aware of what's going on around us. You know, huh? Complacency is a good, good word for that. So it's talking about not spiritually aware of what's going on around us. We need to be aware of people around us that are 
lost. And it may help us understand why they do some of the things that they do because they don't understand truth. We need to be aware of people around us that are hurting. We need to be aware of people around us that because it's those people that are hurting that many times that's the opening to really share truth with them and help them come out of what they are in. Uh, we need to be aware of people around us that are, uh, that are really discouraged and depressed and try to be an encouragement to them and help them out of what they're in. But sometimes we're so wrapped up in our own world and our own problems that we're not really aware of spiritually what's going on around us. We do need to be spiritually alert. And so because of that, we are... Uh, we find ourselves, uh, it makes a church very weak. When that church is not aware of the needs of their community, when that church doesn't really, let's be honest, sometimes they may not care about the needs of their community. And so we have to think about what, what position we need to get ourselves in to make a difference in this community. We need to find out how to get the truth to people. And you know what? Sometimes they'll receive it and sometimes they won't receive it. And we want to find those times that they're ready to receive that truth. We want to be alert of how we may minister to people and care for people. I hope you all noticed the last two months how much God is blessing here at this church. How many new faces we've seen and uh, how many people are coming in. We, run maybe, we may only run 115 in Sunday school, but we run over 200, maybe 230 or so in our worship service. And, and we need to be aware of, of these folks, of their needs, but also the rest of this community. I don't know about you, but, and Matt says this to me all the time. He said, I ain't never going to be satisfied. I ain't never going to be satisfied. You know, and we never should be satisfied. Well, that's enough. Do you know there are churches out there, I've had preachers tell me before, that people come up to them and they start getting a lot of new people coming to church and they say, we expect you to stop all these new people coming in here. Because they are going to take over our church. We, this is our church. And we don't want them coming in here taking over our church. I've literally heard that from a number of pastors who've been told that. And, um, uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't surprise me. But pastors have run into some pretty tough things in times past. And uh, people get those ideas. Well, this is our church. We've been here for years. We paid for it. And these folks come in here, they're going to outvote us. And for long, they're going to get their way on everything. And we're not going to get our way. So you run into some stuff out there. Thank the Lord I've never heard that because I'm not real sure I'd handle that very well. But anyway, uh, but he says the importance of us to awake uh, for our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. So he's talking about there, the time is near, number one. The, blank, the next blank is the, the number one there. The time is near. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the first seven verses talks more about that, how that the Lord could, could come at any moment and, and, and how we're to be ready for those moments. It even says there about awake from your sleep. And then and, and, uh, the next one is the urgency is needed. Urgency. Do you feel an urgency about spiritual things? Do you feel an urgency about them personally for your life? You becoming what God wants you to become now, not five years from now, now. Do you feel an urgency for our nation, for our community? Do you feel the time is now to make a difference? Do you know by the end of this year we could be running 300 in worship here? If our numbers continue to grow, and what would we do with all those people? Uh, where are we going to get more Sunday school teachers? And where are we going to get more Sunday school rooms? And, and how are we going to take care of this many people? And We come up with all kinds of answers. But the fact is, if God sends them, He intends us to take care of them. Amen? And I pray He does send them, whatever that may be. Because these are people that we get to pour into their lives. And whatever that looks like, we need to make sure that we understand 
the urgency of the hour, the urgency of today. The Bible says today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. People need the Lord today. And we need to make sure. And that's why I don't understand, and that's why I struggle with a lot of the, the, the uh, I'll just flat out say it, the Calvinist movement today. I struggle with a lot of it because what these churches are doing, they're stopping giving invitations. They don't do outreach. They just say, if, hey, God wants people to be saved, he'll just save them and bring them here. Well, I believe the Bible says go with the gospel into the world. Take the good news to people. The Bible says apart from the foolishness of preaching, that's how people are saved. And that doesn't mean preacher preaching. That means all of us preaching out there in the world. Tell them about, about how much God loves them. But the reason is, if there's no urgency, we won't have an evangelistic effort here. We won't have a passion to see people changed. And friends, as, as our world, do you think, how many of you think our world's getting spiritually darker? <laughs> Pretty much all of us, right? It's getting darker and darker. And we used to be a Christian nation, and now we're a post-Christian nation. And so with a world that's getting darker, what needs to happen from the light, the people of the light? Our light needs to shine brighter, doesn't it? It needs to shine brighter. And you've got, you can't make up that decision for me. You've got to make it up for yourself. Every one of us have to decide that urgent is the hour that we stand in. It's time now to turn my light up, to let my light shine brighter and make sure that wherever I go, I don't care if I'm buying gas at a gas station. Those folks know that I'm part of the light. I'm not part of the world. It may just mean smiling at somebody in the inside, taking your money for the gas and saying, I hope you have a great day. Guess what? The lost world, the dark world, is not telling people they hope they have a great day. They want them to get addicted to something and, you know, and, and maybe they can sell them something else. But I'm here to tell you the world needs God. That song, People Need the Lord, is so true. And we've got the Lord and we need to share Him. So, so there's, a, by, by the way, a survey done uh, some years ago, Dr. Paul Kittner of Cornell University lectures, he he, he talked to, uh, he was with a bunch of other scientists at the uh, U.S. National Academy of Science, and, and, and they, say, uh, they say we may see more and more violent storms on the sun. Uh, I don't know if you've ever studied about the gases on the sun and everything and how they have explosions. And, you know, if you got flares, you know, if you get those solar flares, I mean, if those flares go out, if they reach the atmosphere of, of the earth... They can shut down whole areas, whole nations because of solar flares. And, and it just says more about the world we live in. Uh, and, and they were talking about this and, and several other types of natural disasters. And here's what they found. They found among college students, this was a few years back, but they found among college students there was complete indifference to that. They didn't care. It wasn't a big issue. They were more concerned about what was on their phone and what was on the internet. And they were more concerned about their friends and where they were going to go party that night. There was very, they found large amounts, large percentages were very indifferent. To prepare us for what might happen, for what is happening, we need to be prepared. A second thing I want you to see in verse 12. So watch vigilantly verse 12 says the night's far spent the day is at hand therefore let us cast off the works of darkness so here's what we're supposed to do about the condition of the world and to make things better word i use to match this is war valiantly war valiantly w-a-r yes sir I thought people might ask me how to spell valiantly, Mike, but I didn't think they'd ask me how to spell war. <laughs> Help me, Mike. Help me here. <laughs> oh, okay. Put off darkness. The next blank. Put off darkness. Who decides that? Who decides if you're going to... You know Jesus, when he, when he got down on his knees with water and a towel and he washed the disciples' feet? 
You know why he was doing that? He was, he was using that as an illustration, two illustrations really. One, to show that he was a servant. He had a servant's heart. But two, he was showing them that every day we need, the, the world sticks to us. Would you agree? And by washing their feet, he was showing, and he said, you need to do this for each other. He was saying each day, help keep the world washed off of you. Because it sticks to us. It sticks to us. What do I mean by the world? I want to make sure we all, you all understand what I'm saying. What is the world? Let's make it easy. Everything is not God, right? <laughs> Everything is not godly. Or holy, huh? Yeah, the bad stuff. Because how does it stick to us? It gets in our mind. That's one of the places the Bible says we need to make sure our minds are washed by the water of the Word. Huh? Eyes, things we see. You let those things come in into your mind, and if you don't filter them out before long, they'll be in your heart. And if they get in your heart, they'll affect how you choices you make, decisions you make. Say again? Our speech. Our speech, yeah. Yeah. But it, it gets so much easier when, when you got the world, when you're walking with the world and you're okay with the world being attached to you, before long you'll act like the world. What you're full of on the inside, the Bible says, is what's going to come out in your life. And so we have to be so careful that we don't, Jesus said, take time every day to, to kind of wash confess, like I was talking about Sunday night, confess sin in your life, confess things that have gone into your mind and down into your heart, and try to get all that stuff washed out of your life. The Bible calls it, again, Ephesians, I think it's chapter 5, talks about washing our minds with the water of the Word. Let the Word filter out that trash. Let the world filter out all that cussing you heard all day today. The profanity that you've seen today, the, the immoral lifestyles that have been crammed down your throat these days. And if you're not careful, you okay, Joe? Yep. I just make sure you're okay. Joe said he really likes the TVs. He said we could turn the saints on about noon on Sunday and, and he could watch the saints right here. No comment. No comment. <laughs> and it's so important. It's so important that we make a specific effort to put off the darkness. The second one, the second blank is put on the light. Put on the light. There's a verse in the Gospels. I don't remember exactly where. I'd have to look it up and see which one. But it basically says this. If you have some demonic things in your life, and if you wash them away, if you cast them out of your life, and you don't refill that space with good things, it says those demonic or evil things will rush back in, and it'll be worse in the end than it was before. Now, here's what that says. We don't just get rid of the bad. We've got to replace it with good. Does that make sense? I mean, if you've got, let's say you're listening to a song or you're watching a video, music video, and it's got a lot of really negative, ugly, worldly things in it, and, and you decide to confess that and you say, God, I'm not going to listen to that anymore, it's not enough just to kick that out. You need to replace it with something better. Does that make sense? You've got to replace it with something that'll, that'll claim that area for God. That'll claim that. Because if, if the last song I heard is that bad one, and I still sing it every now and then because I'm thinking about it, guess what? It, I'm not forgetting that. But if I put a different song in there, and I learn to sing that song, eventually I won't remember that song that I kicked out. Is that practical? Does that make sense to you? So I, I can't just get rid of the bad. i got to give something better in that place. And so... You say, well, preacher, you're just kind of talking about like, uh, it's almost psychology. No, it's not psychology. Someone, somebody once said that uh, being a committed Christian is just like a, a crutch. Y'all just have to have that for a crutch. Well, let me tell you something. I, I've never had a better crutch than Jesus, amen, than the Word of God. That's a good thing to lean on. 
But I tell you something else that you, you think about it. Um, if you if you ever forget that phrase of of uh, you know the world uses the term brainwashed. Somebody's brainwashed. Well, you Christians are just brainwashed. Well, I'm gonna tell you who's brainwashed. There's a lot of people brainwashed in this world today. Except the water of the word washes our mind to clean it. The water of the world washes the mind to control it. And I, I, don't, I don't have a problem with saying, man, the Word of God, I want it to be what controls me. I want the Word of God to be what empowers me and, and helps me to do uh, what is right. Uh, look at, look at if, I just want you to underline that verse because I've talked about it a lot. Ephesians 5.26. Ephesians 5.26. It's talking about how Jesus Christ, verse 26, and underline it if you got it or mark it or highlight it or something, that he, speaking of Jesus, might sanctify and cleanse her. It's talking about husbands loving their wives and, and Christ loving the church. And, and how important it is that we're cleansed, the last part of verse 26, we're cleansed with the washing of water by the word. So it's like letting the word of God be what? purges all the ugly, the dark, the dirty things out of our life. And if you, you wouldn't go wash your hands in nasty, dirty water. You'd want clean to get the dirt off, because if you didn't, you get through, you still got dirty hands. Maybe they're worse than when you started, but you put clean water on them, and you get them cleaner. So, putting on the light, putting the Word, turning on the light. And if you work in a tough place, uh, or you live in a tough place, man, God needs us to turn the light on. Turn the light on in that area, okay? And so that's how we handle this world. I said, I kind of had an old title here, How to Live in Babylon, and, um, and, it, and it is, it makes us feel a little bit like our world's becoming more Babylon, more a world we don't know. And what does God want us to do? Does he want us to cower down? Does he want us to just quit? Does he want us to just lock ourselves in the church? You know, does he... Maybe he wants us to act like the Amish people, you know, and all of us live on a, a farm somewhere. We go out and buy 100,000 acres of land, and everybody gets a 1,000 acres of peace, and we just have our own covenant there of people. You know, I'm going to tell you, I admire the Amish people. I don't necessarily agree with everything they believe, but I'd probably agree with about 95% of it. I love the Amish people and what they do. And the reason I don't live my life that way is because the Bible says we're to be in this world and not of this world. I think they're not of this world, but I don't think they're necessarily in this world. I think they've kind of separated themselves from the world. And they're very, very Calvinistic in their beliefs. They believe, You've got to come to them. They're not coming to you. You've got to come get what they got. And so... Uh, I think God sends us out into the world to reach the world. And uh, so because of that, it's so important that we, that we make ourselves known in this world and we stand up for the things that are against God. The Bible says we always lift up a, a banner. Here's who we are. Here's where we stand. Not in an ugly way at all, but just try to say here's, who, here's what God says. And we're not going to be ashamed of what God says. All right, number three in your outline, walk virtuously. Walk virtuously. Verse 13. I'll speed up a little bit. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. So when he talks to us about that, he's telling us, first of all, resist. I kind of say resist public sins. Resist public sins. Um, walk properly as it's in the daytime. The Bible talks us to walk, tells us to walk worthy of the calling with which we've been called. Walk worthy of having the name of Christ on you. Just in the last two or three months, a pastor in our area abandoned his family, run off with a lesbian girl he was seeing in a relationship. And and uh, <laughs> that don't make sense. But anyway, that's what I said, and that's what I meant. <laughs> I know the facts. And 
got back into drugs. He had been a drugs in the drug market before, and they found him dead in another state just recently. All that happened in the last few months, and just demolished a church that was growing like crazy. You know, that doesn't just hurt him, and it doesn't just hurt his church. Do you know that affects us? People that hear about that, they say, oh, y'all probably just like that dude. Y'all just ain't crashed yet. He crashed. You ain't crashed yet. Y'all fake. They're fake. We have to make sure that we live what we say we believe. And that doesn't just mean, I see Lane back there and he's got his West Monroe shirt on. He's been coaching today and all that kind of stuff. But I'm telling you, that old boy, he went to, he went to practice and they was used to coaches cussing right and left and all that stuff. And he told him, boys, he said, I'm going to tell you something. Not only am I not going to cuss you while you're here, you're not going to cuss while you're out here. <laughs> you know? You know, we need to tell people where we're staying. And then we need to live it. We need to live it. How important is it that, that you're not one person that, on church on Sunday and you're somebody else on Monday? Or you're somebody else on Saturday night or Friday night. You're somebody else then. You're not, you're not Mr. Christian or Miss Christian that goes to church on Sunday. When we get out in this world... In this changing world that we live in, one of the greatest things, somebody said the, somebody said the only book some people will ever read about God is you. In fact, the Bible says we're a living epistle. That means people read us. Now, they read us, and don't think that reading us is enough. You know, somebody said, well, I'll just let people watch me. Just watch how I live. Well, let me tell you something. Somebody's got to tell them how to be saved. Somebody's got to tell them what. Okay, you watched me. That was a good bait. That was a good introduction. But now, let me tell you what's your next step. I've lived it. You appreciated that. Now you need to repent of your sins and come to Jesus Christ and ask Him to save you. You know, there's just... Uh, there's big steps that we need to take. We, we have to resist being like the world. There's a lot of religions out there. Some of them you know, some of them you don't know. Now, there's religions of hedonism, which is pleasure. And, uh, there's all kinds of religions out there. A lot of religions now is about how, how rich you can get. You know, the prosperity gospel. God wants you to be rich. And there's a lot of things out there that we need to be different. And we need to say, this is what God has laid on my heart. The, the second one, resist private sins. Not only public sins, but private sins. Those things that nobody else sees. Those things that happen behind closed doors. Those things that, that only us and God know about. That's where we have to be real. Somebody said a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, and usually our weakest link is when we're in private, not when we're in public. And so we need to remember that. Focus on our... Am I being legalistic by saying that? Some of you may be sitting out there saying, I'm going to tell you, that preacher, he's, he's, he's talking about not doing drugs, and he's talking about not being a, a fornicator, and he's talking about not going out like Brenda and getting a shot before she came to church. And <laughs> I'm having fun with this, Brenda. I don't know if you are, but I'm having fun. Anything you can. Give me a give me a shot of heroin. Give me a shot of morphine. I just shoot me up. <laughs> it's not gonna make Mark disappear. I just want you to understand that. So it's not gonna do that much. But here, here we see. I'm not trying to be legalistic. I'm not saying if you keep all of these rules, you're gonna please God. No. We ought to be so in love with God that we want to be like God. We want to walk the paths that He walks. Not because we have to. Because he's, if He has saved you, He's not going to quit loving you. 
because you blow it sometimes. But you ought to walk the, want to walk that path because that's the path Christ walks. That's what He walked on this earth. None of it, and, and I don't want to break anybody's heart, but none of us here are going to do it perfectly. But that ought to be our desire, shouldn't it? That ought to be our want to. I want to do it the best I possibly can. And so that's what he's talking about when I say walk virtuously. Let's look at the last one. Wait victoriously. Wait victoriously. The verse 14 says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put Him on. How do you do that? How do you put on the Lord? I, I don't look at Him as like a coat. <laughs> Some overalls. I, every morning I need to get up and put Him on. Study His Word. How about deciding that day that I want to live this day for the glory of God? That's putting Him on. That's putting God on my mind. That's asking God to guard my heart. The Bible says guard your heart, for out of it comes the issues of life. Putting on the Lord is saying today, Lord, it's your day. I'm walking with you. I'm following you. I want to obey you. Because listen, if we don't do that, we're weak that day. If we don't live that day, in fact, the Bible says get up every day, deny yourself, and, and basically profess God. And if we don't decide that day that God is in control today, guess what will happen? You'll take control sometimes. You'll start walking in your own power instead of God's power. At the end of the day, you'll say, boy, I blew it a lot today. Because Christ was not at the front. So number one, put on Christ. Number two, put off corruption. It says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the second half of this verse says, and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, all those things the Bible says is not of God. So you and I have to decide all that. We have to decide today, am I willing to put on Christ and put off the world? Am I willing today to represent Jesus? What does it mean, just one last thing, what does it mean to make no provision for the flesh? Those sound like good terms. We read that and we say, yeah. And then we say, wait a minute, what's that mean? <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? Make no provision for the flesh. Or, or don't put yourself in bad positions. Heard a young lady who got pregnant with a boy, went parking one night, went pregnant. She said, I, I'm a Christian. I don't believe in that. I, I don't believe. But she said, you know, we got there and he started pressuring me and before you know, it was over, and I'm pregnant. What did I do wrong? What, what's wrong? Pastor said, you should have never been there. You see, don't make provision for the flesh. Don't go to that place where you're going to be pressured. Does that make sense? You see what I'm saying? Don't let it, don't put yourself in that weak position. Don't, don't try to make a decision... You know, when you have basically by agreeing to go to the place, you said, I'm willing to play with this. I'm willing to, I'm willing to consider it. I, I'm telling you no, but I'm, the moment he, you agreed with him to drive there, you said, maybe. You said, maybe. And we should be wiser than that. That's what he's saying. Don't make, well, I'm quitting doing drugs. I don't do drugs anymore. But I go to parties where they're doing drugs. And when you showed up at that party, you know what you were saying? You weren't saying, no, I'm different. You were saying, 
Maybe. Maybe I will. Right now I'm strong enough, but 30 minutes from now I may not be. If you're an alcoholic, don't go sit in a bar and talk to your friends. I knew guys, I've had guys tell me that they don't even, they used to drive by a bar. It was their favorite bar for 20 years. Drove by it every day from work, going to work, going back. Had to drive by that. You know what they did? They said, I had to change my route to work. I don't even drive by that bar anymore because every time I drove by there, a little voice said, stop and go in. You know everybody in there, stop and go in. Make no provision for the flesh to take over. In other words, head it off at first base. <laughs> Don't go in the wrong direction. That makes sense? All right. Because you don't want to be fighting against the devil in your own power. Because, friend, you can't beat the devil by yourself. you got to let God help you do that. Okay? All right, let's stand up and we'll be dismissed. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. But make sure your cup's good. You got to, you know, because I used to have, I heard a guy one time, he said, I heard a guy pray every time he prayed on Sunday. He said, Lord, fill my cup. Lord, fill my cup. One time after about a year of doing that, somebody spoke up and said, Don't do it, Lord, his cup's broke. <laughs> All right. Let's close in prayer. Father, we do love you. We thank you for loving us. God, we know that you've got a bunch of weak folks who haven't always handled things right. God, help us to be different. Help us to touch our world. Help us to impact. Not hide in this world, but impact this world. Help us to not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to those who believe. Thank you, Lord, for helping us, showing us clearly how to live in a changing world. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.